I hope this morning that when we leave this place, we will all have a better appreciation and understanding of the day of Pentecost. And especially that we would understand its relevance uh, to our lives today. It was about, in fact it was, 50 days after the children of Israel had left the land of Egypt. They had miraculously been delivered. And through the work of God, because of his love and his grace and his mercy for them, he brought them out of 400 years of slavery. 400 years. He brought them out of misery. He brought them out of hopelessness. He brought them out of hard, cruel labor. He delivered them. He saved them. And 50 days later, they find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God appears on the mountain in fire and smoke and thunder and lightning and the sound of trumpets and all kinds of uh, of things. It was actually, when you read Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and you read the account, uh, the Bible tells us Moses himself was terrified. <laughs> if Moses was terrified, you can imagine what everybody else felt. But it was there that God gave them the law. He gave them the law and he made promises to them. And these laws and promises were going to mark them as the covenant people of God. These were God's people. Well, it was on a Passover weekend. Centuries and centuries later that Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus died to deliver us from slavery to deliver us from the slavery of sin and death. And 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, on the first day of the week, the disciples had gone to Jerusalem. Jesus had told them to wait and wait to receive a promise that had been made to them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would fall on them. The Holy Spirit would come to them. In John chapter 14 through 16, Jesus talked about that a lot. Right before he was arrested. And in talking to them about that, he said, I'm going to leave you. But then he turns right around and says, but I will be with you. Well, how's he going to leave and still be with them? Well, he, he explains that to them. He said, I will send a comforter. I will send the counselor. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And so it's in the giving of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, essentially to all of these disciples meant that this is how Jesus is going to be with us. This is how he's going to live in us. This is how we are going to be in the company of Jesus himself because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so even though bodily he left, he sent his Holy Spirit to his followers in Acts chapter 2. And so the day of Pentecost is quite interesting because the Jews celebrated it as an annual reminder of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. But yet, when Jesus comes, what Jesus does is he, in essence, is showing that he, he himself, he personally has fulfilled the law. And that all that the prophets spoke of and all that the law was about, it was all fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so when Jesus came, 
It was no longer the law and the promises that were going to identify people as people of God. It was going to be the very presence of God himself in his people through the Holy Spirit. That is how the people of God will be identified. By the presence of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that is how we know we are God's people because God is with us and God is in us in the Spirit of Christ. So please, please understand the beauty, the significance of the day of Pentecost and what it meant to the church. In fact, many scholars refer to it as the birthday of the church. It was that spirit, that life-giving spirit that was poured out on Jesus' followers and their life was never the same after that. All because of the presence of the risen Christ. So, what you heard when Jason read from Acts chapter 2, it was quite an event. There was the sound of a rushing, violent, mighty wind. Well, I imagine that shook everybody up a little bit. You know, I've heard that a tornado, uh, when it's approaching, sounds like a freight train barreling down on you. I'm from West Texas. I grew up in West Texas, and I promise you, I can tell you what a rushing, mighty wind is like. And sometimes we even get a little bit of that here. If you're from Oklahoma, you know what the sound of a mighty rushing wind <laughs> sounds like for sure. And so they're together, all together in one place, and they're praying. And they're doing this because this is what Jesus told them to do. And so they're together, they're waiting, they're praying, and suddenly this sound of a mighty wind comes in. And then there are what look like divided tongues of fire over each one of them. Now, how in the world would that not freak somebody out? <laughs> They've never seen anything like this. They've never heard anything like this. This is, this is amazing. This is unbelievable to them. And yet, what happened as they began to speak in other languages even languages that they did not know beforehand. Even as this happened, they had to come to an immediate realization that this is what Jesus was telling us to wait for. This is why he, when he told us to go to Jerusalem and wait, this is what he was talking about. In, in Acts 1 verse 8, he, he told them that when you go to Jerusalem and when you wait, you're going to receive power. You're going to receive power from God. And so God moves. God comes in the person of the Holy Spirit to all of these disciples of Jesus. And magnificent things are happening. A lot of people there are questioning what in the world's going on. All the crowds of people that were there on the Jewish holiday of Pentecost they're blown away and flabbergasted by what they're seeing and hearing. And so there's all kinds of things being thrown. These people are crazy. They're drunk, whatever, you know. That kind of thing is going on. And Peter stands up and Peter says, this is what Joel the prophet was talking about. This is it. Well, if you were a Jew that knew the law and the prophets, you understood what Peter was talking about. This prophecy from Joel where God said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Men, women, young, old, every, I will pour out my spirit. 
And they're going to see visions. They're going to dream dreams. This is a great and magnificent day, it says. A great and magnificent day. And it's in that, this is one of the times in Scripture, it talks about the sun not giving its light, the moon uh, turning to blood, the stars falling from the sky and all that, and that's perplexed a lot of people. But all it is, it's apocalyptic language that essentially is describing a tremendous upheaval and turnover of the way things are. No longer are the people of God going to be marked out by the law and the promises. Now things are different. All nations, all people, any and everybody can be a child of God because God has made himself available to the world for all generations through his son Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So, they were together, waiting and praying. We're together, and this morning, I want us to wait and pray. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today in your presence and we're waiting on you and our prayer this morning is that you will pour your Holy Spirit on us to refresh and renew our relationship with you our love for you and for one another our faith and trust in you this morning we surrender our preconceived ideas of how you should work and our expectations of who you should work through. We pray today that we may see you move and work in powerful ways. In Jesus' name. Well, someone might ask, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Why should we ask for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God when we are already indwelled by the Holy Spirit? All Christians, whenever, whenever someone believes the gospel, they repent of their sins, they confess to Christ, the Lordship of Jesus, and they're immersed in water. Doesn't Acts 2.38 say you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when that happens? Yes, it does. Don't all Christians have the Holy Spirit? Aren't we all indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Yes, that's what the scripture teaches. Well then, why are we praying and asking for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit? Well... Jesus is recorded by Luke as saying that God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So there's a real biblical scriptural precedent for praying and asking God for his spirit. Furthermore, in Ephesians chapter 5, we read in verse 18, uh, rather than getting drunk on wine, uh, get drunk on the Spirit or be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is to the church at Ephesus. Church was already there. People were already Christians. These people already have the Holy Spirit. Okay? And yet, as Paul is writing to them, these people who have the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ in them, they are told by the apostle, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we find some other scriptures that are uh, a little bit interesting and curious, but relevant to this. In Acts 4, verse 31, again, these are Christians. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together, 
was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Again, these people were already Christians. The apostles were even in this group of people. In fact, they had been suffering persecution, and after they'd been released from prison, they go back to their church family, and all of these spirit-led Christians, we find the Holy Spirit comes upon them in a fresh new way. Now that's what Acts 4.31 says. Also, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and 5, when there was a, a, a problem, some, some of the widows were not uh, being ministered to or getting their food. Uh, to solve this, the apostle said to the church, you pick out from among you men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then speaking of Stephen, Later, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, says, But he was full of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. John and Peter, after people were baptized into Christ, at the preaching of Philip in Samaria, after these people have become Christians, Peter and John, apostles, travel from Jerusalem to Samaria, they lay hands on these people who've already been baptized and the scripture says they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So once again, and I don't know how many times I need to, to keep uh, pounding this, but the fact is there's a lot of scriptural evidence in the book of Acts that Christians who already are indwelled by the Spirit of God, there are times when the Holy Spirit comes on them in a special way. A new experience of the Spirit, a new filling of the Spirit, if you will. And the very fact that cert certain people are singled out as being full of the Holy Spirit, another one is Barnabas in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 24. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And that, that's helpful to me to understand that because uh, there's at least three or four of these that says full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, full of faith. So there must be some sort of correlation there. There must be something uh, about that. Do you think that as the church, we all have the same amount of faith? Of course we don't. It's a rhetorical question. Some people have more faith than others. That, please don't understand when I say that, that someone who has less faith than someone else is somehow some sort of lesser Christian or of lesser value in the kingdom or God looks down on them, whatever. That's not the point. But the point is, we all don't have the same amount of faith. And I go so far as to say we don't all have the same amount of the Holy Spirit. Do we all have the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit live in us? Absolutely. How could I have less of the Holy Spirit than someone else who has the Holy Spirit? Uh, well, let's talk about that faith issue for one thing. Okay? If we don't have the same amount of faith, wouldn't it stand to reason that we don't have the same amount of the Holy Spirit? Now that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's not available and that you can be full of the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit because I believe we all can. That's what, that's what Paul said in Ephesians 5. To the Christians, to the church, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The implication then would be that some of those at Ephesus, at least some of them, were not full of the Holy Spirit, right? If everybody in that church was full of the Holy Spirit, why in the world would he tell them to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It, it, it makes no sense. So anyway, I hope that uh, answers that concern. Well, uh, another another part about that is we all have different spiritual gifts. So we, 
just that fact in itself lets us know that we don't have the same working of the Holy Spirit. There are differences. And they're from the Spirit. So, let's go to the beginning. The very first place we read about the Holy Spirit is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. So what's this hovering all about? The Hebrew word here is ruach. And that word is used for three different English words. Wind, breath, and spirit. And so what we find a lot of times in scriptures, these ideas overlap and are interchanged whenever we read this word, okay? So what we have here is the Spirit of God, the Scripture says, is hovering over the darkness, over the chaos, over the uncreated. Okay? So that would tell us, then in creation, that the Holy Spirit was there as God's creative life force. Because that's who He is. That's what He is. What He does. But the Holy Spirit is not only active in creation, the Holy Spirit was also active in redemption. Because remember when the children of Israel escaped Egypt and now they get to the Red Sea and there's the water and here comes the army behind them and they're, they're goners, they're dead, they're, it's over. And then God sends, what, what did God send to split the sea? What did God send to roll the waters back where they could walk through on dry ground and be saved. And as Paul would write centuries later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when they crossed the Red Sea, they were baptized unto Moses. And when they were baptized, who was present? Who parted the waters? What parted the waters? The wind. God opened it up. He provided a way with the Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the wind that made the way. So, would you pray with us as Charles leads us in prayer? Dear Father, when we face perilous waters, impenetrable barriers, unsolvable problems, and lose hope because the mountains before us are so great. May the wind of your spirit blow and part the limits and circumstances, opening closed doors, parting deep waters, and leveling the mountains in front of us. Deliver us by your Holy Spirit. Make a way where there is no way. Rescue us from the enemy and lead us forward in freedom, peace, and joy in Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, wind of God. Come, Lord Jesus, living word of God. We yield to your creative work in our lives. Make something beautiful in the area of our lives that feel like a void, aware we are struggling in darkness and chaos. Holy Spirit, wind of God, come and hover over the chaos of our lives. We thank you that we are not alone in the darkness, but that your creative life force and energy is at work in and around us, even if we don't perceive it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit as wind. Remember the day of Pentecost? Sound of a rushing mighty wind, okay? Some may ask, am I seeing the fulfillment of God's promises in and through my life? 
Am I currently experiencing the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? If not, how might I give myself to persevering in consistent and diligent prayer? I think that's a question we all need to wrestle with. We are in almost in the middle of a year devoted to prayer for our church. We need, all of us, myself included, certainly, we all need to pray more. We need to pray more diligently. We need to pray more fervently. We need to ask God. When is the last time you asked God to fill you with his Holy Spirit? Jesus said to ask, and you'll receive. Jesus likened the Spirit to wind in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And like in Genesis, we see an interesting correlation in the book of Ezekiel to the Word of God and the wind of God. The prophet Ezekiel was caught up in a vision, transported to a valley full of dry bones. And he asked God the question, can these bones live? Ezekiel's unsure. He doesn't know. But God just told him, you prophesy. And so he did. He did. And he said, so as I prophesied, as I was commanded, there was a sound and behold, rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. And it looked and behold... And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come on them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slains so that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. That's in Ezekiel 37, verses 7 through 10. What you'll read in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, is Jesus, post-resurrection, he comes to visit his disciples who were hiding out of fear. And what did he do to them? The Bible says he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Now, that's very similar to what happened in Ezekiel 37. Sometimes the church is like a valley of dry bones. And the church needs God to breathe on us from time to time and renew us and restore us and encourage us, enliven us. That's what the scripture is teaching us. And we see this over and over again. In Ezekiel 36, 36, God said, I will put a new spirit in you. In chapter 37, verse 5 and 6, I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now I want you to think about that. You will know that he is God when he sends the Holy Spirit into you. He will breathe on us and we live. Just like he breathed on Adam when he created man in the beginning, he breathed into his nostrils and he came alive. And the prophecy in Ezekiel is not talking about Adam. It's talking about the people who will be the great army of God. And the way that we become a great army, a great force in the world today around us, the way that we can make a difference in this world is through the power of God's Spirit upon us and in us. Yes. 
Let's pray. Josh, would you please lead us in prayer? Lord Jesus, breathe on us as you did on your disciples. Breath of God, we invite you to fill us afresh. Search our hearts and minds as we slow our breathing and inhale deeply. May the expansion of our lungs be an invitation to you. Come, fill us afresh. Spirit, sustain our lives and give us hope as we look over the valleys of our lives. We sometimes find ourselves scattered in bits and pieces like a puzzle and we can't put back together. And the parts of our lives sometimes feel lifeless, without joy, without hope, without peace. Father, put us back together. Holy Spirit, bring your life into those parts that feel dead. Bring order and beauty to chaos within us. Lord, we pray for your church that we would be the house of prayer that you intended to be. Forgive our trespasses. Revive us and empower us again. Teach us to pray and send the wind of your spirit to fill us up and center us out. May we all feel the refreshing. And all God's people said. Amen. So back to the day of Pentecost. After the mighty wind, there were tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. The symbolism had to have been clear to anybody who knew the Exodus story. God appeared to Moses in a bush that was on fire. Once they had been delivered, God appeared on Mount Sinai in the fire. They knew this. This was their history. This was the story that is told every Pentecost. Every Pentecost. This is the story that is told. So they had to have made the connection. They had to have known this is the presence of God. God is here. God has come. God is working. The Hebrew writer says, you have not come to a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet. You see, under the new covenant, God has come to us to live in us in the presence or in the person of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist said about Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, fire is beautiful. I love to stare into the fire. The fire is warm. We eat wonderful hot meals because of the fire. The fire is good. The fire brings fellowship in many situations. One of the greatest joys of my life are the times at, at Darbone in Louisiana when we were out at night circled around the campfire and singing praises and praying. But fire can be destructive. And that can be a good thing in what we're talking about. Because you see, fire can burn away what doesn't need to be there. Fire is used by James and, and Peter alike of refining gold. 
and taking all the impurities out of it. And so maybe we should stop and think when the scripture says he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, I always believed that the Holy Spirit was for the Christians and the fire was for the unbelievers. Maybe, I don't know. But I've come to think a little bit differently. The fire just very well may have meant that when you come to Jesus, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will burn away what needs to be burned away. He will purify us and cleanse us. Let's pray. Bruce, would you lead us? O oh God of cleansing flame, send your fire. Please, God, send your fire today. Lord, look down and see us waiting for this morning and send your Holy Spirit to fill us with the assurance of the power, your powerful presence. Please, God, send the fire today. God, you are the creator who formed humanity from dust. Please breathe into us again. Revive and sanctify us by the power of your spirit. Set our hearts on fire with the good news of your gospel. Lord, we yield to you. Burn up in us all that needs consumed and set us ablaze the fire of your love. And all God's people said, The Bible says in John 7, 37 through 41, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? This was the first day of the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is sometimes called. It's a time when Israel would gather for seven days and the priest would go to the pool of Siloam. And he would take water from the pool and bring it to the altar and he would pour it out at the altar to remind the children of Israel of when they were in the wilderness and God brought water out of the rock to quench their thirst. And in that moment, when that happened, when the crowd was gathered around watching the priest pour the water out at the altar and their minds are all upon thanking God that he gave our ancestors water from the rock, Jesus cries out where everybody can hear. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Wow. Think of the shock on the faces of all the people where Jesus constantly is entering into their traditions. He's entering into their rituals. He's entering in to their law and the prophets and their songs and constantly time after time after time he's showing he fulfills it that's what all that's about water from the rock and the new testament scripture tells us who was the rock when they're telling the old testament story and the rock was christ yeah it all comes together. It's all perfect. It all fits. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together and we see beautiful tapestry of the work of God. How marvelous it is. In John 4, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And this is when he's in Samaria talking to the woman at the well. He's not supposed to be in Samaria. And he's certainly not supposed to be talking to a heathen woman who is a Samaritan. But there he is. There he is. And 
And she's getting water like she would do every day to go about her business and her chores. And Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. So what we've read so far is that the Feast of Tabernacles, the water's poured out. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, those who receive the Holy Spirit out of them will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. And now we turn to Ezekiel 47. And we read that water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple. I saw on the bank of the river many trees on one side and on the other. And when the water flows, it will flow into the sea and the water will become fresh. This river of water that flows into the sea does not become brackish. It does not become salt water like the rest of the sea. But wherever the water flows, it's changed. It's transformed. It becomes fresh water. And the trees on every side that have leaves and bear fruit, they're going to bear fruit every month. They're going to bear fruit every month to feed the people. And the leaves, the scripture says, the prophet says, are for the healing of the nations. And if you know the book of Revelation, you read this in chapter 22. You read this. You read this very thing in chapter 22. And Jesus, in talking about the river of water coming from within us. I want you to get this. Because of the work of God in you, because of the work of the Spirit in you, because of the life in you, the nations will be healed. Yeah. Do you understand we are in the flow? We're in the flow of the Spirit. We're in the river. I love, I love as you read, I wish I had time to read the whole thing. This is incredible. You go back and you read, you read what Ezekiel said. And, he, and in his vision, uh, he was taken into the river. And, and he goes in, he's ankle deep. And then he keeps going in, and it's up to his knees. And he goes a little farther, and it's up to his waist. And he goes farther. And finally, it gets so deep, he's just swimming. And a good friend of mine used to be, I hadn't seen him in years, a good friend of mine was preaching at Darbone where Luke's grandfather sat there on the second pew, you know, and he was quite animated. And, and when, when the brother got to that point, he said, and the prophet was just swimming in the spirit. And Big Daddy turned around. He wanted to know what we all thought about that. <laughs> he never heard anybody say that. He was swimming in the spirit. That's how I want to live my life, swimming in the Spirit, in the flow of God, bringing the good news, bringing joy, bringing peace because of the work of Jesus in us, we can bring these good things to those around us. God uses us with his living water. Let's pray. Jesus, our cry is, Lord, give us a drink today. Give a drink to our thirsty souls. Forgive us when we try to quench our own thirst with the water offered by the world. Lord, help us to see you as a willing giver of your spirit. Help us to not believe that you hold back your spirit from us. Holy Spirit, would you flow through our lives? Would you flow through our families? Would you flow through this church? Would you flow through all 
churches and all your people? Would you flow through the streets, the schools, the hospitals, the government? Would you flow, Father? Send your spirit to flow and to change, transform all that is wrong in this world. We know you will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Finally this morning, I know I've kept you a long time. First John chapter 2, verse 20 and 27. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. The anointing that you received from Him abides or remains in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. John's reminding his readers, they have been anointed. Christ means anointed. That's what the word means. We call Jesus Christ. When you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the anointed one. That's what you're saying. When you say Messiah, you're saying the anointed one. Because that's what that means. Messiah, Christ, anointed, it means the same thing. Just different words in different languages. And so, Christian, we wear the name of Christ. When you say, I'm a Christian, you ever stop and process that? Think about what, that, what you just said. I am a Christian. What that means is I have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. I have the life of Jesus living in me through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is in me, and I am a follower of Jesus. I walk with Jesus. I live the Jesus kind of life. That's what a Christian, in theory, is supposed to be. And that's what the word means. And so, let's understand that we have been anointed with the fragrant oil of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think, I don't, I don't know what I think about it, but a lot of people that I've read believe that when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, praise him, come on up, please. When Jesus was anointed by John the Baptist, It was when John baptized Jesus. Jesus went to John and asked him to baptize him, and he did. And when Jesus came up out of the water, the Bible says the heavens were opened. I love that phrase. The heavens were opened. Heaven and earth is come together. And the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Now, Jesus' deity, did he need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. <laughs> but do you know what? God decided to specially anoint him before he started his redemptive work. And that's what that's about. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You see, that's what anointing means. That's what it means. You've been chosen by God. You've been accepted by God. You are his beloved child. You are a beloved child of God in whom he is well pleased. Look in the mirror and see a child of God whom God has anointed and he is well pleased. 
Luke, would you lead us in prayer? Spirit of truth, we invite you to guide us into all truth. Would you teach us by your anointing? Please empower us through your anointing to answer your call and receive your gifts, that we, we may yield to your work in our lives to your glory. Abide in us we trust that you will bear much fruit in and through us for your kingdom. Lord, we pray for those who are not yet aware of your abiding spirit within them. Awaken them, even those in our midst today. Awaken them to the reality of your anointing. Which enables them to preach good news, free captives, and create beauty. Jesus, anointed one, we worship. We're so grateful that through our anointing, we are accepted, loved, and infused with your life. You are our high priest, making a way for us to come into the holy place of God's presence. We are so grateful that you are our king and lord. You are the good news of God. You are making everything.